So I'm going to get a chance to talk to three very smart individuals. They were introduced briefly. I'll just do a quick reminder. We've got uh, Derek Kreifels. Come on up, guys, when I read your name. Co-founder and chief executive of the State Financial Officers Foundation. Taryn Bragdon, he's the CEO of the Foundation for Government Accountability. And Jonathan Small, president of the Oklahoma Council of Public Affairs. Give him a round of applause if you would, please. <clears throat> So, so, Derek, I didn't talk about it, but I know you're involved substantially in the fight on the financial front. Yes. Uh, where, where, bus where, where certain organizations try to use businesses to do things the government can't or won't, and they circumvent it. It's largely known as ESG, but can you explain to the group what you're up to? Sure. So I have the honor of leading an organization called the State Financial Officers Foundation. We work with 35 state officials from 28 states. Um, that are actively pushing back against ESG investing, environmental social governance investing. Uh, to put it bluntly, this is the way for large banks and fund managers to drive a social agenda into our society without going through Congress or the courts. Um, I want to just recognize someone who, a statewide official that's in the room that put his political neck on the line a year and a half ago when we started this fight. Um, he was the first to go to Fox News and to talk about this nationally. Um, Nebraska Treasurer John Moranti, our former national chair, would you stand up and be recognized? <laughs> Without men and women like John and other state treasurers and auditors and Comptroller Hager in Texas and CFO Patronus in Florida and others, um, you know, we wouldn't be at this place uh, bringing the awareness to the issue that we are. And, and just. Give an example real quick, ESG. How do they leverage it and how do you fight back on it? Yeah, so um, these fund managers and banks, um, a lot of them have joined a group called Climate Action 100 or GFANS, the Global Financial Alliance for Net Zero. And they're basically saying, if you want to do business with us, then you need to, to agree to these uh, Net Zero Alliance demands. So, um, you know, carbon neutrality by 2030. Um, and, uh, and what we're saying as market participants is if, if you're gonna drive that agenda and go against some of the signature industries of our state, mm -hmm. we don't have to do business with you. Um, and so together we've had eight states divest over $5 billion from BlackRock, for example. Fantastic. Uh, Taryn, so the Foundation for Government Accountability. I try really hard when asking questions on TV not to ask the question of, when are they going to be held accountable? Because it's, it's, it's so easy to ask and easy to answer or speculate on, but so rarely ever happens. So how do you hold government officials accountable? So one of our big focus areas, particularly at the state level, is getting government out of the way so people can get to work. You talked about the importance of education. Well, for us, it all starts with a job. So if you think about your own life, Think about your first job. So my first job was cleaning out the cow stalls in my parents' barn. So naturally a transition into political world. <laughs> <laughs> but the reality is that there's been not this 50 year war on poverty, instead there's been this 50 year war on work. And so we focus on moving people from welfare to work because you know, men can't become marriage material if they're not providing for themselves. And they can't build families if they're not working. And then at the same time, we look at where does government get in the way of even young people getting to work? Over 40 states require you to get permission from your school district or from government for a teenager to go to work. That's just wrong. We're telling people, don't worry, you can be dependent upon the government. You know, Democrats are all about deficits and dependency, and we're attacking both at the same time by getting people back to work, because America works when people work. So that's how we hold government accountable. I like it, I like it. Uh, by the way, my first job was, I was a stock boy at The Gap. I don't know what that says about me, but that's what it was. Uh, Jonathan, Oklahoma Council of Public Affairs, when you look at this, when you look at affecting things at the state level, Oklahoma, pretty conservative state, you know, what, what are you able to do and how do you do it? Yeah, no, thanks for the question, Pete. So I think it's really important to understand, because you would think, why Oklahoma? 
So in the state of Oklahoma, our state has voted for the Republican nominee since 1968. The Republican nominee has won every county in Oklahoma since 2004. Yet in the state of Oklahoma, our two flagship universities were committing all kinds of horror against children under the guise of gender affirming care. In the state of Oklahoma, as you talked about that K through 12 system, in our largest cities, our public schools were teaching students not to focus on concepts like hard work, taking responsibility for your actions, but rather focus on, these were their words, the power dynamics of those who are oppressors and those versus those who are oppressed, and focusing on systemic racism. So if you've fallen asleep and you thought, I said I was from California <laughs> or New York, I'm not. I'm from the state of Oklahoma. And so we feel like at OCPA, we've got to be shaping culture, policy, and politics for freedom. Where there's opportunities for that is in journalism. We've begun to expose where the teachers union in Oklahoma were encouraging teachers to hide information from their parents and teach them that their parents were racist. And then we had success in getting our legislature to ban the practice. Literally, we had rural schools that were forcing daughters, like one of the five girls that I have in my home, to have to use bathrooms with biological males. When the rural schools said they weren't going to stop that activity until they were made to, uh, we walked down to the Capitol and made them do it in about a month with a state law that protects daughters. You're right, because if you look at Minnesota, they just passed the most radical um, anti-racism curriculum down to K through 12. Anti-racism in math and science, which is really just code for critical race theory. Uh, or New Jersey has now gender affirming education all the way down to first grade mandatory. Explain a little bit more about how that arrives in Oklahoma, not just in cities, but in probably more conservative school districts. Right. How do you, and then what you're able to what has worked when you've taken on unions or taken yeah, on? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. You know, we cannot, and I've heard Heritage Fellows refer to it as this. I mean, higher ed is the madrasas for the left. I mean, that's what they are. Yes. And understanding that the vast majority of teachers have been trained in this Marxist pedagogy. I mean, they just have. And so once you understand that, to your point, you have to give parents the power to hold school boards accountable by obviously through universal school choice, but then also exposing where kids are being hurt. In a very popular suburb in Edmond, Oklahoma, two girls were beat up by a so-called transgender girl in the bathroom. Uh, so this is going on everywhere, and the only way we're gonna stop it is by exposing it to a majority of Americans who are with us and then holding our lawmakers accountable so that they amend state law to protect kids. Absolutely, Taryn, the idea of work, even the idea of hard work, uh, showing up on time has been the target of some on the left as seeing as white privilege. I mean, how do you even address the issue of work? Well, I think that you have to first step back and realize that government has gone out of the way to just make it difficult at every step of the way. It's whether it's an occupational license requirement that you have to go to government to get permission to do something basic. We even had this in Florida where I live uh, within certain counties that you had to pay hundreds of dollars literally if you just wanted to be a mechanic in Miami until we passed a state law banning that because government just puts all these different barriers into place. And so our approach is get government out of the way and really honor the whole dignity of work rather than honoring a bunch of other things that undermine work. Mm -hmm. uh, on the ESG front too, I know we're bouncing around here a little bit, but and feel free to comment on each other's if you want. Do companies want to be doing that? Or do they feel like they just have to for fear of backlash? Because what was interesting to me about the whole Bud Light controversy, let's take them at face value, that the C-suites didn't know about this partnership. To me, that almost makes it worse because someone underneath thought that was the corporate culture of what they wanted to drive in their advertising. Do they want to be doing this? And do they think it really helps their bottom line? 
You know, we hear from C-suite executives um, all over the country, and our, our state officials do, and one of the biggest messages that they're not willing to say in an email or to a press or reporter is thank you. Uh, <laughs> because there is now pushback from the right to say, you don't have to do this. You don't have to cave. And, you know, the, the playbook is the same. As Jonathan was talking about, the attacks, you know, in, in the name of DEI and transgenderism for public education, it is the same playbook to the fund managers, the banks, and the publicly traded companies. And so what we are preaching every day and is And that playbook is shame you until you do... Until you cave or your, your board of directors caves to our whim, you know, to take the uh, um, Human Equality Commission's index and, uh, you know, and, and what we're, again, continuing to say is, like, fiduciary responsibility yeah. is absolutely the foundation of every argument that we make. You cannot include politics of any kind in economic decisions. And you start playing politics with people's pensions, that leads to someone trying to decide whether they can afford to retire at age 65 or they have to wait till they're 67. Because mm -hmm. the returns just weren't there because BlackRock or their fund manager or their pension fund was busy worried about their DEI initiatives instead of what the return was on the investment. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to give you all the kind of the same question, and uh, Jonathan, I'll start with you, just because the name of our, our panel is our fight to stay free. From where you sit and what you see, uh, both locally or statewide or nationally, what is the state of freedom in America? Are, are, we, are we free and getting freer? Are we even free or are we getting less free? What's your sense? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. And I think an honest assessment, uh, even when you look at conservative states across the United States, is that we are facing Ronald Reagan's nightmare, which is that freedom would become extinct. And I think the first thing that we have to do, uh, what one of the panelists said earlier, earlier, Ian Rowe, is we've got to have the courage to say things that are common sense. And this gentleman's agreement that the professional right had that we were gonna stay out of cultural issues because everyone was gonna leave that to themselves. Uh, we can all stop believing that lie now. Um, it's kind of like Dave, you know, Dave Ramsey says that you know, parents don't talk about sex or money and their kids have both. Um, <laughs> well, families and students and 18 to 40 year olds, they're trying to formulate their opinion about how the culture should work. And they need all of us in this room to speak about the success sequence. What causes people to thrive? What are those classical liberal ideas that result in the most vulnerable being able to succeed? If we don't, we are gonna lose this country in the next generation that's not hyperbole. Well said. So I guess I'm a little more optimistic. I think that in many places that we're winning. And I think the reason that we're winning is we're in the fight and that we don't have our blinders on anymore about the size and scope of the enemy or just the constant engagement that we have to have. You know, one of the big lessons from the Trump years is if the media is always going to hate you, then you're not surprised <laughs> yes. when they hate you again tomorrow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you just realize that you have to continue fighting. So I think that we're winning and we're whining a lot less so I think that's good. And we're just in the fight and engaging, whether it's in the home, in the school, as you've highlighted, or in the legislature, or in the corporate boardroom. We're punching back, and that's how you beat a bully. And the left is a big bully propped up by the media and government money. But we can fight back, and we are. Well said. Yeah. And, and I would agree with Tara, and I think we are winning. Um, you know, I think bold leadership emboldens more bold leaders to stand up. And folks like Treasure Moranti and others who have put their necks on the line, um, you know, we, uh, we created a, a, an educational campaign that launched in December called Our Money, Our Values. You can go to ourmoneyourvalues.com 
and you can see a short primer video on what ESG is. We were shocked beyond imagination that in an eight week period, we had 32 million households go and visit that website. Mm -hmm. um, we were able to spend some money to subvert if you were doing a Google search on ESG, instead of BlackRock being the first to pop up, it was our money, our values for about two months. It's expensive to do that. So <laughs> we need support to do that. But, um, you know, there's little wins like that where we're seeing, um, you know, these elected officials who are shepherding model policy through state legislatures, passing laws to protect fiduciary duty, uh, to uh, protect their signature industries um, in an anti-discriminatory type of laws. Um, and, and the best part of it is, and I've said this, uh, you know, with all due respect to the Heritage Foundation and to all the research uh, groups in the room, Main Street Americans really don't care about your white paper for the most part. What they really care about is how it impacts them, their bottom line, and their wallet. And so we don't win this battle on ESG without making sure that Main Street Americans know exactly how that has led to inflation, higher diesel and gas prices, higher prices at the grocery store. And so the more that we can do that and connect those connect dots, dots, we win. Absolutely. Well, I do love, in addition to America's Outpost, the idea of Heritage is, is forwarding, which is going on the offense. It's been so much defense in the conservative movement for so long, and I, and I think, Taryn, you're referring to that. Going on offense, when you, it's like when in the military, if you're, if you're in an ambush, the last thing you do in that near ambush is crouch down and try to survive. You have to charge back at the other side, which forces them to pop out of the tall grass and expose where they are and what they're doing, and that is the product of going on offense. Let me ask all three of you again. I'll start here and go that way, so now you've got time. Uh, if what, what are the top three things, if you want to go on offense, change the trajectory of our, of our country, create the American dream for future generations, an incoming, let's say there was to be an incoming Republican administration, what should a Republican administration or a campaign, frankly, be focusing on right now to be on offense on the issues of freedom and the issues you're working on? I would say um, we have had a couple of, of presidential candidates. Um, former Vice President Mike Pence has done amazing things to advance this ESG issue nationally. Um, I think protecting fiduciary rule at all levels of government. I think, uh, you know, Chip Roy has introduced a bill that, that protects the federal thrift savings, pro the retirement program for federal government to keep it free of ESG. Um, Congressman Andy Barr. Is it currently that, free of ESG? No, 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 sure. BlackRock and other companies are managing that. As, an, as a retail customer, you have the freedom to call your financial advisor and tell them, I don't want in my money invested in BlackRock anymore. BlackRock is the biggest offender. Um, and I would encourage you to find alternatives. There's plenty of other groups outside of iShares and the, and the group of folks that are leading BlackRock um, that are really working to harm us. Uh, so um, those are some of the things that we would really encourage people to do. And Our Money, Our Values actually has a five question uh, easy PDF, downloadable PDF that they can take to their financial advisors mm -hmm. and ask great questions. And then the last one is, well, if the answer is yes to any of these, my, are the fund managers uh, pushing a DEI initiatives? Are they pushing transgender initiatives? Are they activist shareholder proposal? Are they pushing activist shareholder proposals? Um, then if the answer is yes, then tell me who else I can invest in mm -hmm. uh, because I want my money pulled out. Love it. Taryn? So I would, uh, rather than three, I'll give you two. Uh, one, I think it's focusing on work. We have 10 million open jobs. The uh, Kevin McCarthy and the House Republicans in their debt deal had work requirements uh, for childless adults. These are adults with no kids and no disabilities. Right now, they're not required to work. Florida is the only state with a statewide work requirement for these adults on food stamps at this moment. We need to have a lot more work and move people from welfare to work. So that's number one. Number two, the biggest, most powerful enemy that we're all up against is the administrative state in yeah. Washington, D.C. I absolutely agree with that. We need to absolutely have a check and balance on that administrative state. And there's a simple proposal that says, look, Congress has to sign off on costly executive action, whether that's new regulations, new guidance, like canceling student debt payments, or even economically significant things like canceling oil and gas drilling permits. What a lot of people don't realize is several states already have this proposal, Florida, Colorado, Wisconsin, West Virginia, and that's how you keep the bureaucrats in check. If you can keep the little socialist minions from doing bad things on their own, it protects all of us. So work and a lot less bureaucracy. 
Yeah, they're counting on a, a lot of people not looking and not having the ability exactly. to have oversight on that for sure. Jonathan, you're back, clean up for us. Yeah, no, thank you. And so I am optimistic as well, because I know represented in this room, many of you are giving to freedom infrastructures across the states. And I think there's three things that conservative groups across the country can focus on, is one, educating. There's really three core groups of people. There are influencers, lawmakers, and the public. So educating them about what's going on under their own noses. And then I think the second thing is advocacy and requiring that all of us as individual citizens get involved in getting across good public policy like universal school choice as donors, as investors, making sure that those organizations that you're funding are committed to advocacy and bringing more people involved. And then I think finally it's focusing on culture and being willing to stand up and say those things that are common sense and support those who are doing it, whether they're business owners, nonprofits, your own pastor at your church, mm -hmm. uh, wherever people are willing to stand up and say things that are common sense, we need to be rewarding that. So last question, and we, one thing Heritage wants us to emphasize is a deliverable, a takeaway. And I know we talked about policy, but if you were to say to this audience right here, here's something tangibly you could go do, um, whether as an activist or as a donor or as a, as a voter, what, what would your advice be to individuals here as, hey, when I leave this ballroom, this is something I can do today? Well, uh, as I said, I would, I would uh, go to your personal financial advisor. If you're a state pensioner holder, if you're a, a pensioner, uh, that's, that's got a state pension fund, get involved in your state pension board meetings and hear how the appointees of your governors and your speakers of the house and your, and your majority leaders are, um, are voting uh, or working along with some of these big fund managers. The other thing I would say is, you know, this, the office of state treasurer, state auditor, isn't quite as sexy as attorney general or congressman or governor. Um, call your state treasurer and encourage them to be involved in our fight uh, if they're not, ask them why, um, gives a little pressure. But if they are, call them and just thank them uh, because they're often forgotten uh, statewide elected officials that are, uh, because of some polling that we did, they're the most trusted statewide elected official on all things financial in your state over their governor and certainly over the member of Congress, regardless of party. Interesting. So uh, I would say, you know, um, a couple different things. One, continue to just lead by example. I, I think sometimes that we undervalue the importance of just being, a, in you know, my case, a good husband, hmm. a good father, a good employer, and a good member of the community. That's an important role, like uh, that's the backbone of America. So don't undervalue the roles you're playing in family, faith, and community every single day. That's critical. The next piece is just recognizing that for a lot of elected officials, it's a pretty lonely existence where you just hear from people who want stuff or hate you. <laughs> and what's great about everybody in this room is we don't want stuff and we don't hate them. And so you can have a big impact just by being encouraging and saying, we want to work with you on this particular solution. I think what Derek and his folks are doing from the state treasurer role of literally transforming bad actors that are multi, multi-billion dollar companies by having one elected official stand up, it transforms that. But it's a lot easier to stand up when you have a few other people locking arms around you. And all of you in this room have that capacity. So I would just say, keep doing what you're doing with faith, family, community, and work, but at the same time recognize you can have a really big impact by just directly engaging with your elected official in a focused way. That's our primary audience, working with state and federal elected officials, and they need more encouragement, and they need help being more courageous. And you can play that role. No doubt. Yeah, you know, so I, I would encourage you to think about you and your neighbors. And at the risk of sounding like a pastor, I'm going to ask you to do one thing. Find one person who is under 40 and share with them, have you heard the success sequence? What does the success sequence result in in the United States of America? 
whether you're black, white, purple, with pink polka dots. If you just did this, get a skill, get a job, then get married, then have five kids like I did. You don't have to do that part. Uh, is that what it is? is? Explain the success sequence yes, for those that don't know The success sequence is merely get a skill. It can be finishing a high school diploma, auto mechanics, uh, technician certificate, something like that. Then get a job, then get married. If you do that, 97% of the people that have done that today, they're not living in poverty. But here's the powerful thing. Of the poor that have applied that principle, 75% have moved into the middle class. We have the keys to thriving. We just have to be willing to share it. So I'd encourage you when you leave this conference, it could be a younger family member, it could be an employee, ask them, have you heard about this cool thing called the success sequence and what you do in order to thrive? And that's what I would encourage people to do. I love it. Um, I'm gonna call an audible here real quick. If if someone has a question near the front and they have a good voice like a sergeant major. All right, right there, sir. Go ahead. So I'm Michael Hoover, from Canada, United States Senate, Michigan. My first question is to you. I'd like to interview you. Would you agree to that? <laughs> You'd like to interview me? Well, first start, yeah. <laughs> maybe. It's a solid maybe. That's awesome. Thanks for being here. Of course. The first stop was uh, to the pastors in Detroit, and they agree with what you're saying. They want educational freedom, and they want dads back in their homes. They want to know how we can help them do that. That's the that first question. The second question is, is, why aren't we going out to every single Christian organization across our state, across our country, and encouraging our pastors to get Christians to vote? That's, the third question is, okay. there's a new tax credit limit coming. I wonder if you're aware about that, where you can take a deduction and it goes to a private fund, which eventually will go to kids wanting to go to a school of choice. Thank you. Great, great questions. Thanks for the microphone. Um, well, first of all, on the, uh, anybody want to address the idea of fathers in homes and how you facilitate that? I mean, that's... I, I, think, it, I think so much of it comes down to faith and comes down to um, personal responsibility and instilling that. It used to be something churches did, used to be something communities did, used to be something, an ethos that was created that reinforced that, it's completely collapsed. Uh, and then on the pastors, I think on the education front, pastors are the most important component. You have a massive congregation who are with you for one hour a week, and then you're not commenting at all on what's happening to your flock for the rest of the week, including being honest about what's happening in school. So I, I think part of a renaissance or a revival of education certainly starts with pastors. But anybody else want to address any other aspect of that? So I think you're spot on that there's a really active role for the church. And I think you're accurate that we think of the church as something that happens in a building on Sunday or something that maybe happens with a smaller group on Wednesday night. Uh, I was privileged, I live in Naples, Florida, uh, several years ago to start up a charity, it's called Better Together, and we work with churches to host job fairs. Think of churches, they're buildings of employers and people who hire. But they're oftentimes in great locations and their parishioners come from the suburbs and go into these churches, but the churches aren't engaging with the community. So we started working with churches to host job fairs. We've now done this in over half the states, had 20,000 people go through these churches. And what's great is you're meeting an immediate need, but you're being relevant in their life. And you're providing a great volunteer opportunity for people of all ages and stripes within the church. So I think there's a lot of things we can do outside of government, but it requires the same kind of thing of standing up, getting involved, and really revitalizing institutions that used to serve this role before government took over. Mm -hmm. I, I would just, I would add that the faith component is really important even in, in our treasurer's world. Um, at our national meetings, if you were to come to one of our national meetings, um, one of the first breakfasts that we have is called the prayer breakfast for the states. And that started six years ago when we had a group of state officials who said, they called me and they said, hey, can we just all get together in a suite the night before the meeting starts and share each other's, you know, prayer concerns, issues with our kids, mm -hmm. 
issues with our spouses. And so one of the things that we've learned as we've advanced all this really wonky financial public policy <laughs> is that at the end of the day, what I care most about is my friendship with John Moranti, not about his real estate treasurer, because he has a wife and a daughter, and, and we care about uh, learning and building friendships and relationships with the people that we're working with, because we can get a lot more done when we kind of know and have each other's back. Um, and so I love the question, because I think that that's a component that a lot of times in public policy or politics, we kind of separate them, we silo them, and I think they can all be integrated together. And I think that we actually improve our lives and the, and the situation much better when we do. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, ma'am. Um, Hold on, we gotta, we'll get a microphone to you real quick. It's on the way. I'm a school teacher. <laughs> um, and I, thank you. I love all of your, your comments. Work is a dirty word. Uh, Mr. Small, your success sequence, fantastic. Your success sequence is fantastic, but I can't teach it that way. Um, what I'd like to say is out, and I'm also a Christian, um, and the single largest thing my kids pull me aside to ask me about is my faith, because I can't teach it outright, but they'll pull me aside. I work in an alternative school where kids don't have much of the components that you talk about. I just encourage you, Mr. Small in particular, I work right over there, you can see where I work. <laughs> men outside the faith community, men outside the faith community, I don't mean to be sexist, that are willing to admit their faith in, in, and to convey this message, it's really strong. So if anybody feels like visiting my school, <laughs> you're welcome. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Well, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for being the definition of salt and light. Students inherently imprinted on your soul to seek truth. Mm -hmm. uh, and because God has been ripped out of those schools, they've been left searching for other things that are empty. Uh, and so I know there are millions of people just like you who want to do the best by them. And you're right, in alternative education, it's more difficult no doubt, because the supply of schools on the outside isn't the same as public education can provide um, of, as far as alternate ec educational opportunities. But uh, I, I salute you. I appreciate that. Anybody else? All right. Any other questions? We've got time for one more question. Gentlemen, right in the front. What about trying to amend the welfare laws so they don't drive the father out of the home? I agree completely. Well, I think you're spot on. That's one of the reasons that we think if you're going to be receiving welfare, whether that's food stamps or Medicaid uh, or cash assistance, that you have to work. Uh, and it's true for men as well as for women. When you look at when we put into place work requirements for mostly single moms with welfare cash assistance in the 1990s, you had enrollment drop 60%, you had child poverty drop 40%, and so it's important for men to step up and work, but it's also important for parents to be responsible and to go to work, whether they're men or women. And I think what we've done is, you know, the whole story of Julia under Obama was government replacing the man in the home. But what we need to do is have government not undermine men or families, but instead in encourage it. Amen. Well, our, our time is up, but as someone who was a young conservative uh, in Washington, D.C., and always knew where a refuge was, was the Heritage Foundation. There was always a place standing firm amidst the swirling nonsense of not just Washington, D.C., but of our culture. I mean, on behalf of Derek, Derek Taron, and, and Jonathan, I want to thank Heritage, thank all of you for the role it has always played. It remains a bedrock and a rock in a sea of insanity. Uh, and, and for that, we thank you very much. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, guys.